we have a very special guest. He's really uh, familiar to most of us. Um, I don't know if you realize, so really over the last five years, we have partnered with the, the Zambia Project. And the Zambia Project is such an incredible ministry. Uh, it's not just providing clean water to uh, villages in, in western Zambia, but it's bringing the hope of the gospel through church planning. And so Matt Mackey and Savannah uh, are back in town, and we love them and so thankful for them. And Matt's going to be sharing with us. So Matt, why don't you kind of uh, come back on up? He has the best voice, guys. You're going to, you're in for a treat. Um, but um, yes, welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. And so, so Matt um, and Savannah have become really close friends just even over these last few yeah. years. I am so blessed by not just their friendship, but their heart uh, to bring Jesus, um, not just to Zambia, but to Arkansas yeah. and, to, and to everywhere you guys go, you yeah. want to see the hope of the gospel transforming lives. And so, uh, again, welcome him. He's going to preach, and uh, we're going to receive communion later and just thank God for what he is doing. So Good. Good, good. Thank you, Pastor Jay. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Jay. <clears throat> you are privileged as a church to have an incredible pastor, and, and Jay's been a great friend of Sav and I uh, for, yeah, the last few years. I feel like I've known him for years and years, but um, it's good to have friends in ministry, that person to call uh, when you don't know what to do, and uh, Jay is one of those people, and he always knows what to do, so... <laughs> And I'm here with my beautiful wife, Savannah, and uh, uh, we have two young boys, Denver and Everett. They are with uh, Sav's folks in Arkansas at the moment. Uh, Sav and I have been through an incredible journey of being in the mission field in Zambia for 13 years. I'm from South Africa, Sav is from Arkansas. And after 13 years of, of planting life-giving churches and villages, we felt the Lord stir up a vision and a dream in our heart that what we had experienced of seeing the gospel transform communities amongst an unreached people group, that we were to take this love for the simple gospel and start to plant churches in other nations. And, uh, and so we moved over to the U.S. earlier this year to plant a, a hope church in the U.S. that works hand in hand with our hope church in Zambia, sister churches working as one in two completely different places of the world, but united by the cause of the gospel. And, uh, and so in Zambia, we continue to work hard with our team uh, to establish a life-giving church within walking distance of every village. That's around 2,500 churches that we plan to plant in Zambia in our lifetime. And that is a, a mission that's too big for one region and, uh, and for one church in Zambia. And so we are planting a church here in the US that's gonna help to carry this load of reaching the lost. And so we've been here for a few, a few months now and the US has been incredible and very different. Our one-year-old, his first words were, wow, wow. And that he gets probably from me, just driving through the streets, wow, wow. Here, if it was in Iowa, it would be, I'm freezing, I'm freezing. <laughs> I sprinted over from the car this morning to get into the church to try and stay alive and warm. And as I'm running, a young guy comes walking past in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> like, this is wrong on so many levels. But... Uh, it's, it's been an amazing journey, and God has been so good to us, and we're excited to see what He does in this space. So thank you so much to each one of you as, as you have been a part of this journey of what God is doing in Western Zambia. And what drew Sav and I to this area 13 years ago was that there's so few people who were willing to do anything about it. A region where the life expectancy in some of these remote villages is as low as 29 where waterborne diseases are causing up to 60% of children to die before the age of five, children drinking contaminated water and, and getting sick and dehydrating because of the water that they were drinking. And uh, the answer first is always the gospel because we wanna help people to find their savior and to live for eternity in heaven. And so our mission is to bring a life-giving message 
of Jesus Christ. And years ago, we realized that none of these villages had the Bible in their language. And NCBC had contributed, and you were contributing towards Bible translation, which was benefiting us in Zambia as we started this Bible translation project. And there's so many highlights I would love to share about what's happening in Zambia, but I just want to touch on, on two or three before I go into my message. And the first is regarding Bible translation, and there's a picture that will come up. For the last 12 years, we have been translating the Bible into five languages, the New Testament, and we have now completed the New Testament in these five languages. And the first language, the Kwamashi language, has now been uploaded, believe it or not, onto YouVersion, onto the Bible app. Because when you go to these villages, what's crazy is there's no roads, there's no water, there's no electricity, but there will be a little solar panel on someone's roof, and people will have these funny little smartphones and will be able to access the Word in the most remote villages. And so this use of technology and generous givers who've helped us to translate the Bible has meant that even in the most remote locations, the word is accessible now to thousands and thousands of people. And uh, so thank you for playing your part in that. And then there'll be some pictures of water wells. And uh, this is a cause that is very close to my heart because it's such an injustice. You know, we are spreading the gospel. We're telling people, you know, there is a, a, a king in heaven who knows you by name. He knows who you are. He knows where you live. He knows the, your village. He knows your language. He knows your tribe. And he loves you. And then to see that so many of these young kids are dying from something as simple as just water. And to think, man, we can do something about this. It's one thing to tell people that Jesus loves them, but we have to show that with our actions. And, uh, and so we started to install water wells, and we've installed 163 water wells, and in the last uh, few months, we installed another seven, and you have been a part of contributing towards this financially and making it possible to provide clean water to these villages. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. We see the fruits of your giving. We see the life change of your giving. And so when you're sowing into this church and into the Zambia project, it is helping thousands of people to experience the love of God on the other side of the world. And uh, I love this scripture in Daniel. It says, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars for eternity. That scripture is not gonna come up, unfortunately. It's just come to my mind while I'm standing here. But it's a wonderful scripture. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars for eternity. And so when we do our part and we make personal decisions to help others, we will shine like stars for eternity. Uh, And what a beautiful picture that is. And, uh, And then church planting, just to share a few little updates on this. There's around 1.3 million people in Western Zambia who have never heard of Jesus. And I've loved following the series and some of the sermons that you've been working through in in the last few months on uh, revelations and the second coming of Jesus. And and Jay is a phenomenal teacher on this. I've learned so much. But the reality is that as we read in Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. There's a beautiful picture also outlined in in Revelation chapter 9 of every tribe, nation, and tongue being present in heaven, worshiping God. And as excited as I am for the second coming of Jesus, I know he will not come until every tribe, nation, and tongue is reached with the gospel. Revelation 22 verse 20 says, He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And so when we use our lives to help take the gospel to unreached people groups, we are playing our part in the second coming of Jesus. We are playing our part in his mission. And what a tremendous privilege that is that he would use ordinary people like us to play a role in his mission and in his kingdom. And so thank you. In the last year, 
we had set the target of planting 30 churches in villages across Western Zambia. And by God's grace, and I say by God's grace because it's not our intellect, we're not that smart, we planted 45 churches in villages that did, had not heard the gospel. And so turn to your neighbor, pat them on the back, give them a smile, give them a fist pump, and say, well done for playing your part. So we, as we continue to plant these churches, we're reminded constantly by the urgency that villagers who have not experienced or have not heard of Jesus, they have not experienced the love of Jesus in their home and in their communities and in the outpouring of a transformed life. Because that's what I love about Jesus is it's not a set of rules. It's, it, our, our faith is not religious practice where we just follow rules, but there's no relationship. A walk with Jesus is a walk with Jesus, hand in hand, where he says, I will be your counselor. I will be your best friend. I will be your teacher. I will be your provider. I will be your protector. You will never stand alone. Any Liverpool soccer supporters here, or is that a stretch in America? <laughs> Liverpool, and I'm not a soccer, I'm not a Liverpool soccer fan, but uh, I know that their saying is, we will never stand alone. They're so united as a team because they fight for each other. And, uh, and that's the picture of Jesus. He says, when we walk with him in a relationship with him, we will never stand alone. And it breaks my heart because we go to villages where they do not know Jesus and you see a community of people lost, like sheep without a shepherd. And, and we went to one village and we shared the good news and we said, you don't need to live in fear any longer. You don't need to feel alone and lost and scared of witchcraft and curses and all of these things. This is something of the past. Jesus is the king of kings. Nothing can touch you when you are within his kingdom. And this is such good news for generations after generations who had never heard the gospel. And there was one lady who was visibly upset by this message, crying, cross. And uh, we went and spoke to her and said, what's, what's upsetting you? Why, why has this message brought about this, this anger? And uh, she said, well, in their village, they had been taught that if a, if a baby's first teeth, uh, when the teeth come down, come down from the top, that child is a curse to that village. And this poor lady, her first uh, son, her child started to teeth and his teeth came down from the top. And the village pressured and taught her, no, that this child is a curse to this community and you have to remove him from this village. And so this lady had to go out into the forest, out in, into the bush, and abandon her only child. And this had happened two weeks before we had got there. And we said, Lord Jesus, we need, to, we need to do this foster. This is wrong. This is an injustice. People need to know the saving knowledge of your message, that you died on the cross to pay the price so that we could have freedom, so that every tribe, nation, and tongue could hear your message. And so there is urgency in what we do. And thank you for adding momentum, for giving us strength, for getting behind what we're doing so that we don't have to hear stories like that anymore. Slowly but surely, we are making a difference in all of these communities. And uh, I'm going to read a passage from Revelations 21, verse 3 to 4. And it paints a beautiful picture of what will happen when Jesus does return. It says this, Revelation 21, verse three to four, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and they and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for, for the former things have passed away. And this is a beautiful picture of when Jesus returns, yes, he will return and there will be judgment. But for those who are walking in his kingdom as a child of God, there will be full restoration as to what life dwelling with God should have been like. 
And when we read in Genesis chapter 1, we see how God dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden, and it was beautiful, and it was perfect. And they walked in the gardens with the Lord in His presence. There was nothing that was separating them from the presence of God. There was no sin. There was no sickness. In fact, God had not just, He did not just walk with them. He gave them responsibility. He trusted them. He, he believed in them. Genesis 1, verse 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. This amazing picture that God created us in his image. His beautiful character of love is what we should reflect. His beautiful uh, a character is the, is the character that we have inherited. But Adam and Eve were deceived. They believed a lie. And in Genesis 2, verse 8 to 11, we read about the fall. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want to jump into some New Testament scriptures. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. Uh, this is Genesis 3, verse 8 to 11. And he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So because of their rebellion, they started to feel fearful. They started to think that that God's image, being made in God's image, was not enough. They started to feel like they, they were not enough to stand in God's presence. We were afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And when we read in John chapter 8, we, we hear how the character of the devil is a deceiver. He is the father of lies. It talks about how his nature is to lie. And so he loves nothing more than to deceive and to get us to believe his lies. And, and here you see God saying to Adam and Eve, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? And it's amazing how easily as we live life on this earth, and we've been created in God's image, we start to believe the lies that get attached to us about our self-worth. Who told you you were not good enough? Who told you you need a certain bank balance to be valuable before God? Who told you that your education is where you find your identity? As is the case with this lady in the village. Who told you that God does not love your child and that your child needs to be abandoned, that your child is bringing a curse to this village. Who told you? Who told you? And it's amazing how easily we can start to attach these lies onto ourselves and it starts to take this beautiful picture of how we were created in God's image and it starts to diminish how we see ourselves. But that's not the way God sees us. We have still been made in God's image. And the beautiful picture of the New Testament is that Jesus comes and he says, he goes from every town and village and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And that phrase repent, it, it means to, to change the way that we think. In other words, to, to, to change the way that we think towards Wow, the kingdom of God is near. Jesus is establishing a new kingdom that we have been made set apart that when we walk towards him, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, that now we are accepted as we are forgiven grace, a free gift from him. And Jay preached a little bit on this last week. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured, he poured God's goodness into us. What a good father that he would do this for us, that he would take our wrongdoings, and not because of 
our abilities, our strengths, our intellects, our knowledge, nothing to do with us. Our goodest deeds are still tarnished by our sin. I'm not a good baker, but once in a while I try to bake a cake. And uh, it was Sam's birthday and I wanted to make this special three-tier cake. And I'm not one for following the detailed baking instructions. And when we were in Zambia, you don't get cake in a box where you just add water and the cake mixes complete. So you do everything from scratch. And everything was perfect. All of the ingredients, everything. The flour. What else goes in a cake? <laughs> Sugar. Everything was there. I read the instructions. And I put the eggs in. Everything was going on track. But then I saw it said the instruction for the eggs was two large eggs. And our chickens in Zambia are not American chickens. They are small. When I see the chickens in the, in the store here and I see, uh, I think, wow, these are massive chickens. And so they say, okay, let me add one more egg to this mix because our chickens are small. So that will be three Zambian eggs, not two large eggs. And the mix is perfect. All the ingredients are fresh and good and measured. And I put the last egg in and it's rotten. Will, every, will anyone notice if I just mix it up and throw it in the oven? <laughs> if you have tasted or smelt a rotten egg, it's a smell that just destroys anything good. So I started again. And the cake wasn't amazing, but it wasn't the egg's fault. It was just my baking skills. <laughs> but it's amazing how you can have all of these perfect ingredients, but because of one egg, it's like it's scent. It tarnishes everything that is good. And that is what sin is like. So as much as we can want to try and get our good deeds to outweigh our bad deeds, and to think that that will be enough for us to be righteous in God's sight, even just the smallest slip in our thoughts and sin tarnishes even the best deeds that we have done because that is sin. And so we are in need of a savior. And so when Jesus came and said, repent for my kingdom is near, he's saying, change the way you're thinking. You cannot do this by yourself. You need a savior. You need a savior. For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. So all of the wrongdoing that we have done, God took that and he gave it to his son to carry on the cross. And in exchange, he gave us all of Jesus' good deeds, Jesus' perfection, his righteousness, a gift that we do not deserve. He gave that to us for free. The good news of Jesus Christ. Repent for my kingdom is near. Jesus is coming to refresh our minds and to change the way that we think. This is what he would do going from town to village to person. You need a savior. You need a savior. Stop wandering like sheep without a shepherd was his message. We run children's homes in Zambia. We've got six homes, uh, around 40 kids in those homes. And those are children with, where they have nowhere else to live. And it's a beautiful picture of what it looks like when someone comes and is welcomed into a family. And we have one incredible young boy, his name is Mubi, Mubiana. And his mom, many of you might have seen Hope Art, the Hope Art bracelets that we make and sell. And uh, his mom was one of the Hope Art ladies and she used to make these beautiful bracelets. But she was sick and we could see her health was in decline and, and, uh, and she was not getting better. And she came to us one day and requested, please, I know my health is not improving and I don't have much longer to live. Can you please look after my son, Mubiana, in your children's homes? And uh, of course, we said, yes, there is a bed ready for Mubi. There is room at the table for your son. And, uh, and so we took Mubiana into our homes and it was two weeks later that we heard the news that Mubiana's mom had passed away. And so we had to go, one of our missionaries had to break the news to Mubiana to say, this is what hap has happened, your mom has passed away, she is with the Lord now. But Mubiana was in this home with 
new kids around him, a new family, and it was such a beautiful picture because when we shared the news, his new family came and sat around him on the floor and cried with him. And his new brothers, who he did not know before, came and sat with him as if they had known him his entire life and that they had been uh, uh, family, uh, biological brothers his entire life. Meanwhile, they were complete strangers, but they were brought together under one roof, under one family, and they carried this burden with Mubiana. And, and a few days later, there was the funeral. And standing there next to the grave uh, site, Mubiana stood there with tears pouring down from his eyes, and his new brothers stood with him with tears pouring down from their eyes. And they held his hand, and they loved him. And afterwards, they went back to their new home, and Mubi was absorbed into this family and loved. And he didn't need to do anything to deserve that. He didn't have to pay a price. He didn't have to pay money. He didn't have to sign into an agreement. He didn't have to change his name. He just had to walk into this family, and his bed was ready, the table was set, there was provision for him, there was safety for him, there was love and a family for him. And because of what he has received, his response is, man, I have been loved unconditionally, I'm going to love. And that has become the story of his life. And he's an incredible young man, and that's a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of undeserving favor that we have received. And what that means is it's not just that we receive this gift from God and now we wait for eternity, but we've received this gift from God and it changes the way that we live. It changes the way that we see people. It changes the way that we love. It changes the way that we see life. We've received a gift. And so our response to this gift is to worship God in the life that we live. We are a part of this new kingdom. Jesus' kingdom, where he sits on the throne. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 to 10, it says this. <coughs> I'm also coughing, it's all right. Sav is making fun of me because when we were driving up yesterday from Arkansas, Sav was sleeping in the car, nice sleep. And uh, <coughs> I was driving and very sinusy, congested, and I could see this white fluff blowing in the air. I'm like, ah, pollen, <laughs> pollen. No wonder I'm stuffy. There's <clears throat> pollen blowing off the trees everywhere. And Sav wakes up and she's like, wow, it's snowing. I was like, okay. I thought it was pollen. I grew up in Africa. We didn't have snow. <laughs> I got distracted. <clears throat> 1 Peter 2, verse 9 to 10, how we're a part of this new family and it changes the way that we live. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. I love that, God's very own possession. I was reading up, Michael Jordan auctioned his shoes, his Air Jordans, for $560,000. That's just an ordinary pair of shoes, nothing fancy, made out of what other shoes are made out of. But because of the person who owned them, they took on great value. They were owned by someone significant and well-known, and so because of the owner, the shoes carried great value. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Because of your Father in heaven, the family that you are a part of, you carry great value. As a result... You can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. What a beautiful picture of coming into this family. You had no identity, now you have identity. You had lost God's image. You were taking on all of these lies of what media and people and pressure was telling you you needed to look like, you needed to sound like, what you needed to do to be successful and to carry value. We attach those lies, that gets removed, 
because we recognize that we are image bearers of our God. We receive his righteousness, not because of anything that we have done, but because of who he is. That is where we get our value. And as I close, as we've gone to different villages, I've always been amazed by what happens in a community that fully receives and lives in this image of God. And and the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 9, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Now on this side of eternity, yes, we walk carrying the image of God and in relationship with Jesus. And he is there as our savior and as our compassionate father and counselor. But we still live in a broken world full of injustice. But that doesn't mean that we must hide what we have. Remember, our response is to tell others and to show others the goodness of God in the way that we live. In essence, to bring heaven to earth in some small way and to let this light shine into areas of darkness. And there was a village that we went to, its name is Fur, right on the border between Zambia and Angola, arrogant about their witchcraft. People feared this region. And we went and we sat with this community and we shared the gospel with them. We told them about the love of Jesus. And the chief in the village stands up and he says to his village, we will accept Jesus as our king. I said, that's amazing and thank you. And I appreciate that you're on board, but it's a personal decision. You can't make the decision for your whole village. And he goes to each person, you will accept Jesus. You will accept Jesus. You will accept Jesus. I say, no, 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 it's still not how it works. No pressure, but you are loved by God in heaven. And you can take his hand and he will protect you. And he is the king above all kings, which means there is no power or authority on this earth that is more powerful than him. Do you, do you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Is there gonna be a renewal of your mind where you leave these old things and you turn to him and you know you need a savior? And the entire village did make a decision together that they were going to serve Jesus that they were gonna leave behind what they had known, their sense of security, their sense of self-worth, the things that they had placed their identity on. And they were gonna leave that and they were going to become this alternate society amongst this cluster of villages, that they were going to reflect Jesus in the best way that they could. And the nature of the region is that the Zambezi River breaks its banks for about six months of the year. And so after sharing this message with this village, we had to go back to our base camp, which is about an eight hour drive away, and the river flooded, and it was six months before we could get back to this village. We had the coordinates, and as the waters subsided and we were able to cross the river, we went straight and we wanted to know, we wanted to get back to these young believers and help them in their walk with the Lord. And we started driving and, and trying to find this village, and we had the GPS coordinates, we said, but the village is supposed to be here, but this isn't the village that we left behind. And we carried on driving around and driving around and, and asking, where is Fur? Where is Fur? Directed, it's that village over there, the, the village with the big fields. And we went back to this village, Fur. And naturally what had happened over these six months is this community had completely taken on this image of God in the best way that they could. They started naturally through a, re- a relationship with Jesus to become more Christ-like. The young looked after the elderly. They cared for each other. There was a love for kids. Even the dogs were looking fatter because the community was caring for their environment. They took different color clay and decorated the outsides of their huts so that it would look beautiful. Where they had been fearful in the past, they started to, to plow and prepare much larger fields. There was a complete transformation in this village. They were not in heaven, but they were reflecting heaven in their society. And it's like there was this gospel lift that took place and the life expectancy started to change and go up. 
Children were living longer. People were living longer. Relationships were being restored. Difficult conversations were being had where it takes courage to say sorry. It takes courage to ask someone for forgiveness. It takes courage to be generous with the little that you have. And they were showing courage in all of these areas. I love this picture because this is just a small glimpse into what society can look like when a community of people choose to completely receive and reflect the love of God in their town. And it starts with one person at a time, one family at a time, one school, one suburb, one school, I've already mentioned school, one hospital, one single mom, one student struggling to pass his exams, one young businessman trying to get their business off the ground but just not sure what to do, one person struggling with debt, someone not able to buy Christmas presents for their kids because it's been a difficult financial year. These are opportunities that God is presenting to us daily where we can say, we're not in heaven yet. There is still injustice in this world, but I'm going to do my best to play my part to establish kingdom values in our society. And we see a lift happening in the world around us. What a privilege it is that we get to take the hand of God, that we get to change the way that we think. We recognize we need a savior. We receive the image of God the way that he has created us to be, that is how we start to see ourselves valuable in his eyes. And we start to live that out in the world around us. Society will be a different place. Then Jesus will come. Revelations 21, verse three to four. I'll read the scripture again. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. All the former things, all the former things have passed away. That is what is to come. We're not there yet, but we have the opportunity to establish a Christ-like culture in the society around us. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your gift that we get to receive your righteousness, that our our wrongdoings have been exchanged for your good deeds. And we don't deserve that, but we get to receive that as a gift. And so God, I pray that that we would take this gift and our response would be to worship you. Our response would be, Lord, on this earth, help us to bring heaven to earth one person at a time. Give us the courage. Help us to experience your peace that surpasses all understanding, to take all of our concerns to you. And Father, that, that you would lift that, that burden, that fear off our shoulders and restore the image that we were created to live in. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.